Hi guys, welcome back. The next topic we're discussing is types of CNS bleeding. Extradural and subdural are covered in surgery also, though I will also discuss them towards the end of this discussion. But first I will focus on what we commonly see in internal medicine units that is going to be intraparenchymal hemorrhage. Let us first study the why component of it. Apart from trauma, the most common scenario that he will give you in the exam would be a person of hypertensive crisis and once the BP spirals out of control, the important blood vessel in the brain that is the branches of the middle cerebral artery, the lenticular striate artery can pop off and that can contribute to IPH. Then is going to be drugs. Most of the time, he might describe a patient who is having atrial fibrillation, maybe secondary to hypertension. You had prescribed warfarin to this patient. You had prescribed a particular dose, but when this patient went to the chemist, the chemist said, okay, I don't have this company's drug, take it from a different company and maybe the dosage was double of what was actually you had written. Though the patient might have been told by the chemist that you have to take half a tablet initially, but the patient, you know, being a patient did not listen to the instructions of the chemist because he thought that you have written one tablet in the uh, in the prescription slip and the chemist has dispensed a double strand tablet. So warfarin toxicity can contribute to a CNS bleed or I can talk about rape parties as well. You see, in cardiology, I have highlighted that this is a young teenager. He went to a rape party and they were doing, uh, let me say, cocaine. Now, once this guy will be snorting cocaine, it's a powerful vasoconstrictor, so it can constrict the coronary circulation and there's rave party death can occur due to myocardial infarction, but then there's also a possibility know that the same cocaine can contribute to vasoconstriction of the brain blood vessels and therefore the bad news is he could be having a, a brain hemorrhage. In fact, lots of time you would have seen teenagers using crystal meth. Crystal meth is the slang term for metamphetamines. So most of the time it could be a rape party and it could be a young individual developing with a brain hemorrhage as well. Then it could be secondary to brain malformations, arteriovenous malformations can pop off at any point of time contributing to IPH. And my next statement is very surprising because in this case, it's a non-diabetic, non-hypertensive patient. Let me give you a case scenario here. You are having an 80 year old retired military person who comes to your clinic every three months for a regular follow up. He is non-hypertensive, he is non-diabetic, but today morning he had a brain hemorrhage he developed posturing, raised ICT and unfortunately expired. His son is asking you, not that he is accusing you, his son is just asking you, sir, my dad was always under your follow-up. He was a non-diabetic, non-hypertensive. He used to regular come to a clinic for a routine, regular checkup and you never told us that he is having any issues and now suddenly you are telling me today that my father has had brain hemorrhage and he died. Well, I'll explain to the son of this old man that with old age, there can be weakening of the blood brain vessels and therefore the brain vessels can pop off. The condition that I'm pointing out here is taught in pathology also and is called as CAA that is cerebral amyloid angiopathy. Once these blood vessels will pop off, then the person will definitely develop a posturing raise acidity and can die very fast. So obviously decompressive hemicraniectomy or maybe a ventriculostomy procedure should have been done. The message I want to give you is that it is not always going to be a hypertensive crisis. As I highlighted before you, non-hypertensive, non-diabetic male slash female patient developing sudden onset intraparenchymal hemorrhage is CAA and here he can also ask you the genetics component which is the in thing nowadays for any particular disease. They can randomly ask you about the gene involved. So you will read about apolipoprotein E related to uh, the cerebral amyloid angiopathy component. I mean normally you about apolipoprotein A and B with respect to disorders of lipoprotein metabolism but apolipoprotein E has been discussed two times in neurology one with respect to Alzheimer's disease and second with respect to brain hemorrhage. These are some of the important causes how brain hemorrhage can occur in an individual. Now I'll give you a case by which we will be able to understand this better. Uh, I am describing a 50 year old guy he's a banker by profession and is taking a sales meeting today. Now we are going to be focusing on the left side of the brain of this guy. You are familiar that the left side of the brain we have is a Wernicke's area. This is responsible for understanding. This area is basically responsible for comprehension. So any injury to Wernicke's area will cause a person not being able to understand your commands. Lots of time when I'm taking a live class, I might teach something and then I might tell my students, okay, can you please repeat after me? This repetition is actually a function related to arcus fasciculus which is going to connect the Wernicke's area to the Broca's area. In fact, this will itself solve a multiple choice question for you which was like this. The question said that patient can understand everything. 
but he is not able to express himself. The question said, patient can understand everything, but he is not able to repeat the content that you have said. I mean, what I'm meaning here is that whatever you asked him to repeat, like one, two, three, seven, eight, nine, whatever, he is not able to repeat what you are saying. Then he said, which is the area of the brain damage? It would be arcuus fasciculus. In contrast, if you go a little anteriorly, you will notice regarding Broca's area, which is responsible for expression of speech. Now in this diagram, I am drawing a blood vessel, which is the left middle cerebral artery. It's having a superior division and an inferior division. Unfortunately, my patient was having atrial fibrillation and there were a couple of clots developing in the left atrial appendage. And uh, let me just symbolically show a couple of clots blocking the superior division of the left middle cerebral artery. The moment the clots will occlude the blood supply in this case, the Broca's area will be hit, it will not be able to function. And therefore, the manifestations that are going to develop in this patient would be ability to express would be lost. Broca's area is responsible for fluency like I am speaking at the moment before you so uh, my brain is subconsciously picking up uh, words of English language that I have learned right from my schooling days and then I am able to join these words together to form sentences that make sense. Broca's area will also ensure syntax. Well, what do you mean by the word syntax is grammar. Like I said patient will present, present test or I future tense, past tense, yesterday he had this problem, day before uh, yesterday he was suffering from high blood pressure. So I mean I can use English grammar to describe present tense, future tense etc. All of these functions of the broker's area would be lost if the superior division of the left middle cerebral artery is gone and such kind of a manifestation is technically called as motor aphasia. So MCQ wise if they say motor aphasia is a feature of your answer is left MCA superior division. Unfortunately, the clots did not go in the superior division. The clots actually migrated in this fashion and they occluded the inferior division of the left MC. In this circumstances, the Wernicke's area blood supply would be gone. Once that happens, he's not going to be able to understand what you're saying. So the technical term used here is that problem is with reception. So he will say receptive dysphasia. Now, I want you to appreciate the fact that if only Wernicke's area, the words are, if only Wernicke's area is damaged in a patient, then what happens in a patient of receptive dysphasia is that fluency will still be preserved. You see, I just explained to you, you know, fluency is a function of the Broca's area. The damage is exclusively occurring in the Wernicke's area of the patient. So, whatever comes to the mind of this guy. He will continue to speak like he's saying words like dog, chicken, Pakistan. Now, they, the, the three words do not make any sense. But in this case, he's trying to just say random words which are coming to his mind. And you as a doctor will be at loss of words to understand what is this patient trying to say. So we call it jargon speech. The basic message is the questions will begin by saying motor aphasia occurs due to blockage of which blood vessel or he says jargon speech is seen due to blockage of which blood vessel. And let me say, God forbid, if the main trunk of the left middle cerebral artery itself is occluded, then in those circumstances, the manifestations developing in these patients will be much more extreme. And I will write the word global aphasia. In fact, in your wards, you would have seen lots of patients of left MCA territory stroke who neither can understand what you are saying, neither can repeat what you are saying, and neither can obviously come out with any speech because the Broca's area is also gone. So, so I want you to remember three types of aphasia. That's going to be motor aphasia, then Wernicke's area damage, which is results in receptive dysphasia with a preserved fluency and lastly the word global aphasia and so I shall now be describing a case based on intraparenchymal hemorrhage where this 50 year old guy he is a known case of hypertension uh, he works as a senior manager in a multinational company but he neglects his health in a sense that he is non-compliant while he was taking the sales meeting towards the end of let me say 2020 year it has been a bad year for the banks. They could not meet their targets. Like they could not give sufficient number of loans. They could not sell sufficient number of credit cards. So he's literally scolding his juniors. While this meeting is going on and his juniors are obviously not very happy about it. It could be online meeting or it could be face to face meeting. The point is this individual while speaking has developed sagging of the muscles of the face of one side. There is a facial asymmetry that is occurring. His face is looking funny at the moment. So the junior employees are actually smiling at each other, enjoying the discomfort of their boss because nobody wants to listen to scolding from the boss. 
Now the boss who was speaking with his full strength has suddenly developed aphasia. He has suddenly become quiet. So this guy is or these junior guys are amused at the fact that now the boss has run out of whatever he had to say. But they found that his lips were quivering. He was trying to speak, but the words are not coming out of his mouth. So one of the junior guys got up and he maybe poured a glass of water and said, sir, please take a glass of water. Please sit down, relax, take a glass of water. Then we can continue the meeting. If somebody will offer me a glass of water, I will raise my right arm to take the glass of water. But in this case, there is a right arm weakness that has developed in this guy. And this has occurred suddenly, like when the meeting started, this guy was giving a PowerPoint presentation. So he could use his arms left, right. I mean, he was gesticulating his arm actions were there. He was using his muscles. But now there is a sudden onset right arm weakness in this guy. Well, his colleagues will not be able to understand, but you as a doctor will immediately understand that this is a query left MC territory stroke. Why I'm saying left is one because of the fact his colleagues will not be able to understand, but you as a doctor will immediately understand that this is a query left MC territory stroke. Why left MC territory is because of the fact that, uh, well, one aphasia is a presentation and then the right arm weakness is there in the patient. This guy has to be rushed to the hospital. So they may be transported him via a ambulance or a private vehicle to the my hospital. And when I physically examined him after one hour, two hour, whatever time that it took them to bring him to my hospital, I noticed he was having brisk reflexes. You see, whenever brain is damaged, there is loss of inhibitory control. So therefore the reflexes tend to become relatively faster. The patient also ended up with development of Babinski sign. Or he can write extensor planters or he can mention regarding Chadock sign or Gordon sign which are variants of eliciting the extensor planters. I tried to do a fundus in this guy and the patient was non-cooperative at this particular junction because of all the testing that I was doing on him. Or I could have written the word papilledema also but you know the moment I write papilledema and features a stroke you know it is brain hemorrhage. So I am deliberately like an examiner now not giving you leads of telling that this is a case of raised ICT secondary to a CNS bleed. When I physically examined him, the power in the left and the right arm, there was a disparity. The power in the left arm at the shoulder joint was only 1 by 5, whereas on the left arm, the power was perfectly normal. At this junction, I have decided to do a urgent non-contrast CT head in this patient. You would be aware from the American Stroke Association guidelines that the door to CT scan time, like if a person comes with suspected stroke at the moment, you should be able to perform a CT scan within 20 minutes right it could be weekend it could be holidays it could be christmas it could be diwali but this protocol is to be followed he can also ask you regarding what is the door to ct scan interpretation time in those circumstances the cutoff that you will answer will be 45 minutes and if a radiologist is not available just because he's celebrating the new year party you yourself will be interpreting the ct scan of this person now let us look at how the CT scan of this person will look like. I can show you an image also but I will just try to hand draw before you how the image will evolve or how the image will load up on the computer in the exam before you. I am trying to describe a intraparenchymal hemorrhage which is itself a question. Here you can visualize the lateral ventricles and then the third ventricle partially. This would be the third ventricle that I have shown bang in the middle. I'll draw some anatomical markings here also, so please be patient while I just highlight them. The first one here is the caudate nucleus, the one that we study which damage to which causes uh, chorea, which is adjacent to the lateral ventricle. Now I am drawing an anatomical structure adjacent to the third ventricle, which is thalamus, and this happens to be the pain relay center in the body. Just lateral to this, on the periphery where I am shading at the moment happens to be the putamen. And the area where there is no shading present that is relatively white at the moment is what is called as globus pallidus. Once we get these anatomical markings right because this is the, itself a question like in anatomy they have just put pointers like these and asked you about these anatomical structures. I now want to highlight the presence of internal capsule that I have shown in color green. Traveling through the internal capsule of the patient is going to be the corticospinal pathway and uh, well if the corticospinal pathway is hampered then there would be neurological deficit occurring in this patient. 
in fact uh, i want to highlight that in internal capsular stroke if a, if a internal capsule stroke will occur there is a possibility of a person developing a pure motor manifestation there would be no features like aphasia apraxia given you see if it's a cortical stroke along with hemiplegia there could be manifestations like uh, uh, aphasia apraxia but in a capsular stroke which is currently highlighted there could be only paralysis of face and only paralysis of the arm itself you see the area that i is likely to be damaged in this particular diagram is the puta main in fact this is itself a question that which is going to be the most common site for brain hemorrhage or answer is puta main which is drawn a little laterally the blood vessel in this case that would be involved would be lenticular striate right arterial just jot down the questions here the commonest site for intraparenchymal hemorrhage happens to be puta main the blood vessel that will bleed in this case whenever they ask you bleeding no you need to obviously know about the source per se so the source in this case is going to be the branch of middle cerebral artery rather one of the bigger branches of the middle cerebral artery lenticular striate now i'm going to make this diagram a little untidy by showing that there's going to be bleed which will increase in size and it is uh, pressing on the corticospinal pathway it is pressing on the internal capsule in fact if this bleed will increase further it will even involve the thalamus and in fact it can even even compress the ventricles so don't be surprised if in the exam they might actually give you a ct in which they might be even exaggerated appearance of the ventricles of the brain i modulated the diagram to show evidence of obstructive hydrocephalus developing in this patient and now he might even develop posturing you see in brain hemorrhage the deterioration can occur very very fast in a individual so initially the patient might look stable to you but as the bleed evolves because ultimately the bleed will stop because of tamponade effect only but by the time the tamponade effect will develop it might actually press on the ventricular system and cause a dramatic rise in intracranial pressure so there are two things that i need to handle now for this particular chap who's had a brain hemorrhage one is going to be the management of uh, hypertensive crisis why i'm saying crisis is because he was a non compliant patient so the bp of this guy could have spiked and resulted in this disaster and uh, anyway the pressure in the brain is rising the cut off for hypertensive crisis given in cmdt is 220 by 130 mm of mercury on the internet is 180 by 120 i have highlighted in my discussion guys that it is not the value of blood pressure that is going to decide crisis emergency you see there are two terms hypertensive crisis slash emergency and hypertensive emergency it is not the mathematical value of blood pressure it is the target organ damage that decides whether you gonna call it a crisis or you wanna call it urgency in crisis there is evidence of brain damage and that is what i have demonstrated on a ct in this guy therefore don't focus on the value of bp he might just mention 170 by 130 170 by 120 in the exam with evidence of cns bleed in a ct it is still a crisis so i need to reduce the blood pressure of this guy to at least decent values therefore i will be using nicardipine now why not sodium nitroprusside yeah sodium nitroprusside can be used but you will notice it is given lower down the order per se in the textbook because nitroprusside causes a sudden fall of bp now when you cause a sudden fall of bp the problem is damage where had to occur has already occurred the adjoining area is the one that i want to save now and if you cause a sudden fall in blood pressure then the adjoining area can exhibit an infarction so you are actually causing more damage than benefit so he says use a drug which is rather having a more predictable control that is nicardipine the older edition used to mention labetalol yes sodium nitroprusside can be used but uh, at least in uh, books like current medical diagnosis and treatment it is mentioned uh, towards the end of the discussion and rather is highlighting that in any case of hypertensive crisis with cns manifestations first prefer to use nicardipine once the raised intracranial pressure will manifest in the patient it might be so severe that standard agents like uh, uh, maybe hypertonic saline or mannitol will not work so we will have to be here more aggressive and you will be using a ventriculostomy procedure if ventriculostomy procedure is not working you might even have to go in for a decompressive hemicrinectomy in these patients well for brain hemorrhage i can just say the fact that never be uh, giving too much of assurance to relatives primarily because these patients deteriorate very fast and right before your eyes i mean he might look stable at presentation but then he might develop posturing before your eyes and might actually expire 
the objective of the discussion was to sensitize you to presentation of two aspects one is a guy with hypertensive crisis and a brain hemorrhage and second i told you there can be a mcq saying a non diabetic non hypertensive guy with a cns bleed features could be identical now there is a sudden onset neurological deficit rushed to the hospital developed a postering or died on the way to the hospital the reason would be old age the blood vessels of the brain became fragile due to caa that is cerebral amyloid angiopathy Another scenario which can be asked for brain hemorrhage has already been discussed where I said a atrial fibrillation patient was provided warfarin by you to prevent the development of embolic stroke but warfarin toxicity has resulted in IPH in the patient Now what will you do to control the bleed you see if the bleed will occur due to uncontrolled blood pressure you will control the BP now there's a drug contributing to it One of the methods to control the bleed here is give fresh frozen plasma to the patient but the problem is it is frozen and if the plasma is frozen it will take some time to thaw and by the time you thaw it and give it to the patient the bleed might actually cause catastrophe so i need to give to this chap a ready made source of clotting factors so in a multiple choice question if he begins by saying what is the best way to manage a patient of warfarin toxicity it is pcc it is prothrombin complex concentrates that should be administered to the patient and if prothrombin complex concentrate is not available then the answer is fresh frozen plasma we can even use cryo precipitate also for that matter of fact but you know the primary answer would be given as pcc it's a ready made source of clotting factors now for the next case i will not rather show you a diagram or a ct immediately but i'll rather describe a case before you and you would be able to pick up the bleed immediately This is a 25 year old guy to celebrate his quarter century his father gifted him a heavy duty bike like a Ducati or let me say a Harley Davidson and he is driving this bike all around the city just to show off as a lot of young guys do they are very careless about uh, the security part that is the uh, guy was not using a helmet the helmet was off because he wanted to show off to all the girls in the colony or all the girls in uh, his city that well i have this heavy duty bike Unfortunately in this case the bike skidded and uh, well his head slammed against the concrete road the moment the head will strike the concrete road he will develop a concussion as a result of it uh, this guy became unconscious in uh, india if somebody will have an accident lots of time people will just look and pass on so lots of people actually just looked passed on some even clipped selfies but nobody assisted him Luckily for him after a few minutes he regained consciousness he realized that he has been very very lucky but he is having these cuts lacerations some injuries on his body because he fell from a bike maybe the bike fell over his leg so he is having pain in his left knee also let me say so he decided to maybe take a auto rickshaw or maybe drove that same bike he drove the same bike or, or hired an auto rickshaw he parked his bike somewhere and he took a auto rickshaw drive and he came to your hospital When he came to your hospital, you were busy dealing with a case of ST elevation MI, but from a distance you could see that there is a young guy who is walking with a limp, and he is having his clothes torn, and there are some cuts and lacerations on his body. So you told the nurse that okay, make a MLC for this guy. You told the nurse give basic first aid, that is dressing etc. for this person, and allocate a bed for him. And meanwhile, I'll just see this patient. This guy himself made a call to his mom and dad also saying that okay I am at this X Y Z hospital I just had a bike accident and I'm perfectly fine don't worry mom and uh, uh, I'll be back in few hours and his mom and dad actually have now come over to the hospital as well while you were actually seeing some other case his mother is at the moment anxious she says sir my son just had an accident and can you just have a look. So when you went to the bedside of this guy he was lying on the hospital bed the nurse had allocated a bed to him you thought from a distance that he is sleeping even his mom thought that you know when she came in the hospital she thought that her son is lying with his eyes closed so she thought that he is maybe resting or sleeping so let me not disturb him because 10 15 minutes ago he had himself called the mom saying mom i am okay i just had a small accident i am in this xyz hospital this bed and uh, please come so the message is that at this particular point of time i am under impression that he is sleeping but when i examined this guy i found he was unconscious in fact there is a possibility that right before my eyes he might even start developing postering there is a possibility that he might have already deteriorated into coma and in some cases might die also 
Well, you guessed it right. I'm basically teaching you consciousness between two periods of unconsciousness. So I'm talking about lucid interval. But the moment you read about lucid interval, guys, don't be under impression that the answer is extradural hemorrhage because lucid interval can be seen in acute subdural hemorrhage also. It is the CT scan that will decide. I reiterate my statement. It is the CT scan that will decide whether it is extradural or subdural hemorrhage. Lucid interval can be seen in both extradural as well as acute subdural hemorrhage. The blood vessel that can bleed in case of extradural hemorrhage can be middle meningeal artery. In fact, I can change the scenario. Like he said, this young guy is playing cricket and he's not wearing the helmet and he got hit by a cricket ball. He immediately became unconscious. All his friends were worried in the dressing room. Even the opposition team came over. But luckily after, let me say, one minute, this guy regained consciousness. He played the cricket match then. He maybe played like Dhoni. He played a helicopter shot, the next ball. And he, he launched that ball for a six. He maybe scored a half century. He played the remaining match. He won the match for his uh, club per se. But when he went back to the dressing room, he was feeling a little groggy. And uh, well, he said, okay, let me just lie down. And then he started having posturing and went into coma. And when he was brought to the hospital, he was already dead. When you get that scenario where intermittently the patient was conscious and between that there are two periods of unconsciousness, it's definitely a lucid interval. Now let's look at how a non-contrast CT scan of this would be given to you in the exam. In case it is going to be extradural hemorrhage, the bleed will occur from middle meningeal artery, which is a branch of external carotid, right guys? It's not a branch of internal carotid. This is going to be the lateral ventricle. This is the third ventricle, which has been shown inferiorly. And in this case, there is going to be a biconvex hyperdensity present in a non-contrast CT scan. Most of the time in the MCQ, either he will give theory or he will just give an image of a white biconvex, which would be written as lenticular hyperdensity. As this hyperdensity will increase, there's a distinct possibility that it might press on the ventricles. So there have been instances in the exam when one of the horns might be completely obliterated. This particular horn will not be visualized. And due to the mass effect, the contralateral horn might even be dilated. Once again, I've created a scenario before you of obstructive hydrocephalus developing in a patient. At the moment, I've shown a lenticular hyperdensity a biconvex bleed present in the patient along with this there is evidence of midline shift i mean that's what the examiner will write if he's writing a theory based discussion if he gives you an image then obviously you will have to pick it up otherwise he will say the word midline shift and then evidence of obstructive hydrocephalus is also present in this case let me also put the sides also well uh, this guy he's having a right-sided extradural hemorrhage in this particular scenario He's having obstructive hydrocephalus, so he might even ask you, what will you do for this guy? You see, if the patient of extradural hemorrhage is having posturing, whenever you read about posturing, then in those circumstances, don't answer immediate surgery because the patient would die before your eyes before you take him to the neurosurgery OT. So if he's mentioning about posturing for any type of bleed, you will answer about burr hole surgery. I want to highlight the fact here that burr hole surgery would be done at the weakest part of the brain terion or you can also drill holes anterior and posterior to the terion because if you drill a single or two holes the bone dust the bone dust might actually block the opening of the hole per se so you are just trying to decompress and you are trying to reduce the pressure in the brain though this looks very fancy guys uh, burr hole surgery per se is not the definitive treatment for this condition and lots of time may not be even successful it is just a measure in between the time that the neurosurgeon takes him up if he says what is the treatment of choice for this condition it is definitely going to be answered as decompressive hemicraniectomy a general question for you guys since i mentioned craniectomy earlier also uh, if you do a hemicraniectomy then where will you keep the remaining part of the skull of this guy i mean you remove that half part of the skull no where the bone will be kept now we can't keep it in refrigerator no and put it back later so in a decompressive hemicraniectomy procedure where would the remaining half of the skull be kept? Well, you're going to keep the remaining part of the skull in the 
peritoneal cavity of this patient from where it will get its nutrition and the later part when you will obviously see that the pressure in the brain has come down then you can put it back but the point is immediate management for this guy if given posturing is bar hole surgery that is just a temporizing measure that is going to buy you some extra minutes to save the life of this guy the definitive treatment for this particular chap having extradural hemorrhage is a decompressive hemicraniectomy and as i highlighted never be biased on the word lucid interval always let the examiner give you a report mentioning a biconvex hyperdensity so that you know that it is middle meningeal artery that has popped off in this case and this particular discussion that i mentioned here before you is for extra dural hemorrhage I will now create a scenario of a suspected extradural hemorrhage before you where CT scan facilities are not available. You see the point is if CT scan is available you obviously can pick up a biconvex hyperdensity but if CT is not available and the patient starts having posturing before my eyes how would I decide on which side will I do a bar hole surgery is the objective of this discussion. I have taught you the site of bar hole surgery now I'm teaching you not the site not S I T E I'm teaching you the side if CT scan is not available, you can take this to be the representation of the midbrain. This is EW, that is Edinger Westphal nucleus. This is the oculomotor nerve that would be traveling anteriorly. What I want you to understand is that whenever there is going to be a CNS bleed occurring in a patient, the bleed will have a mass effect and it will press on the oculomotor nerve as well. I have just tried to exaggerate the findings here. The black that I am representing is the lining of the skull. Let us assume this is the bleed that is occurring and it is increasing in size. As the bleed will increase in size, you can see that it will put pressure on the oculomotor nerve and therefore, when you will shine a torch in the eyes of this patient, you will definitely notice a disparity in the pupillary reflex of this patient as compared to the contralateral side. On one side, I have shown the pupil, when you shine a torch in the eye of the patient, will be reacting well to light. But on the contralateral side, when I'm shining a torch, what I'm noticing is that the pupil is uh, rather sluggish and it is mid-dilated. The point that I want to make you understand from this diagram is that even if you do not have a CT scan head facility in your hospital, in a suspected case of extradural hemorrhage, if posturing starts occurring, you have to make a decision that, okay, I'm going to do a bar hole surgery for this guy on whichever side the pupil is going to be showing the particular finding. Well, what is the finding that I've just explained to you? The finding is whichever side bleeding is present, that side there will be ipsilateral mid dilated pupil. It will be exhibiting a relatively sluggish reaction to light, whereas the contralateral side, the mass effect is not so substantial. So you will definitely be able to understand the difference between the two. And the technical term that is used to describe this is called as Hutchinson pupil. The learning for us is that Hutchinson people can help us localize the CNS bleed. The message is as simple as this, that whichever side the CNS bleed is present, on that side, the oculomotor nerve compression will contribute to people in response being impaired. So, the main summary from what I just described before you here was, how do you decide the side of Barhu? Site is Tyrion, side. Well, the site is Tyrion, but the side per se is decided by CT scan report. If CT scan report is not available, it is Hutchinson pupil. And now I create another scenario for you. This guy fell from a bike, but then he fell on his left and then rolled over and maybe he had an impact on the contralateral side also. If a person is having baby bleeds on both sides, or let me say the findings are equivocal. Both sides people are showing a sluggish response. If you get equivocal results, then what are you going to do? Then you cannot know by the by evaluating the patient which side the bleed is present. Well, the concept then is that most of the people in the world are right-handed people. And in right-handed people, the dominant part of the brain is going to be left. So you would drill a hole on the left side. The message is bar hole side will be decided by the three things. First is obviously CT. If not available, Hutchinson people. If not, then at least try to save the dominant side of the brain. So bar on the left side. These are aspects which are taught even in surgery in the neurosurgical domain. But I thought I'll just speak about these because sometimes they can actually be neglected and they've asked about these. And I'm not saying the fact that bar hole surgery is done for extradural hemorrhage. I am saying bar hole surgery is an emergency procedure which is overhyped. Overhyped. It may not be as effective as it is made it out to be. It is done for any patient having a posturing. Let's come to another case now. 
This time I'm describing a 70 year old lady who's relatively obese and is suffering from type 2 diabetes mellitus. She's also having diabetic neuropathy, but she's not aware of this finding at the moment. She has a good habit that she wakes up in the morning every day at 6 a.m. and then she goes to the temple and goes for a morning walk as well. Today morning before going to the temple, she went to the bathroom to take a bath and uh, let me say the floor of the bathroom was wet and she is already having neuropathy that she is not aware of. So she accidentally slipped in the bathroom. Now the moment she slipped in the bathroom, her head actually slammed against the bathroom floor or maybe tap or any other metallic object in the bathroom. So there was a loud noise and his son, daughter, daughter-in-law, whosoever was in the house, everybody came running. When his son saw his mother lying on the floor, initially, you know, he, the son is later on telling you, sir, my heart stopped for a minute when I just saw my mom lying flat on the ground. But then uh, I was so happy to see that my mother is uh, conscious and she was at least making an attempt to get up from the bathroom floor by herself. He says that I did notice that she was having a bump on her forehead. There was a subperiosteal bleed in this particular case. So she did fell down. Her head hit the tap or the wall. She did have a subperiosteal bleed, but at least her son was relieved at that point of time that she did not become unconscious or she did not die immediately. So he said, okay, sir, at least I was relieved by the fact that my mom is better. And I told her also, go, let's go and see a doctor. The mother refused. She said, uh, no, I'm okay, son, and today I'll not go to the temple. Let me take some rest and I'll be fine. From the same day evening or from the next day onwards, she's also having complaints of headache for which she took a painkiller, but the headache is persisting. She also vomited a couple of times. So her son said, no, let's go and see a doctor. But as you know, these old people are little finicky about going and seeing a doctor, especially in COVID-19 times. So she said, no, no, let's avoid, you know, I, my relative had actually gone to see a doctor in uh, uh, this COVID era and this person acquired COVID-19 from the doctor's clinic. So I don't want to go. Let, let me be at home and I'll be fine. Like as old people will say, let me say 10 days have passed by. She has been enduring this headache and vomiting episodes. Maybe she has uh, taken some anti-vomiting drugs, some uh, painkillers also, but the symptoms are persisting. And today, let me say the 10th day, his son or daughter is giving mom a cup of tea or coffee and uh, he or she is noticing that she is not being able to raise her arm because if somebody gives me a coffee, I can raise my arm to take a cup of coffee from somebody. She is having a definitive right arm weakness and that is sending the alarm bells ringing in the mind of this non-medical son and daughter who is now realizing that there must be some problem because of which my mom who is still reluctant to go to the doctor because of COVID-19 scenario, she is having a weakness in her arm. So he said, no ma'am, mom, I want you to take to a talk you to the doctor will take adequate precautions. This lady is now sitting in front of you in your outpatient department and she's talking to you. You are noticing that her GCS values are 15 on 15. She's telling you everything about herself, her name, uh, her son's name. She's calling her son by his name. She can recognize her son and uh, she's addressing you that no doctor, I did not want to come to you, but uh, uh, it's late evening and I was having this weakness. So my son said, okay, let's go and see you. When I examined her, I did find that her reflexes were relatively faster. I did notice that she was having extensor planters, but as such, from the consciousness perspective, she still was not having any kind of impairment. Focal deficit was definitely there. Like I said, right arm weakness was present. So the power was something between one by five to two by five. And I have now decided to do a CT scan in this lady, considering the fact that there is a focal deficit present. I will now draw the CT scan report before you. I'll show you these images also subsequently. But first, let us just practice and hand draw the image by ourselves so that we can understand the process that is going on. And you can understand the way I have described the scenario before you that I'm talking about a subdural hemorrhage. Well, what really happened here? You see, she fell down in the bathroom a couple of days back and she had damage to these bridging veins and you understand that the bleeding from veins will obviously be relatively, uh, I would say, lesser in magnitude as compared to bleeding from uh, the middle meningeal artery, which explains the fact that the manifestations took some time to develop. When you will see the CT scan of this lady, you will notice that uh, you can visualize the lateral ventricles as well as the third ventricle. And then she would be having this bleed, which will be concave or convex. 
earlier i was talking about a biconvex bleed present but now i am talking about a concave convex bleed present so whenever they give you a non contrast ct head in which you can visualize a concave convex hyperdensity do you know that you are dealing with a case of subdural hemorrhage what also happened in the exam was and this is what was brought to my notice by one of my students he said sir everything was fine but you had told that the bleed will look white whereas actually in the exam when they gave us the ct the area which was concave convex he could make out the concave convex appearance but he said the area was jet black and at a different point of time another student had just remarked casually to me the fact that uh, doc we had got this uh, ct that was showing this classical hyperdensity the convex concave convex one but there were certain black black spots inside it which i could not pick up well let me just correlate it together if the patient presents to you early something like within 7 to 10 days of the bleed then you will obviously find the area to be white but you will notice that if the patient comes to you after 2 weeks then there is a distinct possibility that the blood might start getting reabsorbed so you might start getting some black spots of hypodensity appearing primarily because blood is getting reabsorbed and if the same patient comes to you let me say after 4 weeks then the area will appear totally black what i want you to be sensitized to is the fact that subdural hemorrhage whether you will call it acute or whether you will answer chronic subdural hemorrhage is not based on the history it is based on the ct scan report once again the message is loud and clear guys the concave convex bleed could either be white or can be black if it is white it is early presentation acute if it is going to be jet black it's going to be chronic presentation so lots of time both acute and chronic would be written and don't go only by the history you need to focus on even the ct scan finding at this juncture i want to highlight that uh, you know actors like uh, tom cruise he does his own stunts in all the movies of mission impossible so there is a distinct possibility that instead of describing a old lady he might talk about a stunt actor like i can give example of rithik roshan rithik roshan was shooting for this movie krish when he was doing this jumping sequence his head slammed against the side of a swimming pool being a fit guy rithik roshan he thought that you know he it's a minor injury he neglected that but after few weeks he started having this continuous headache vomiting and he had to actually undergo a surgical procedure he had to undergo a evacuation of the clot that was crossing on his brain parenchyma and rithik roshan being a fit guy has obviously survived it so there's a distinct possibility that he may not talk only about a old lady falling in the bathroom he might talk about a stunt actor he might talk about a boxer alzheimer's disease patients are obviously having poor hygiene as i've highlighted they might be urinating in their pants they might be defecating in their pants and because they are unhygienic the caretaker or the son or daughter has taken them to the washroom and in patients of alzheimer disease in later stages of illness they can be rigidity so they might just topple over and fall you see the son or daughter is cleaning his mom or dad because they are unhygienic they pass urine in the uh, undergarments only so the son and daughter has taken him to the bathroom and cleaning them and this person alzheimer disease who was made to stand up from a wheelchair uh, he just toppled over he fell over and had a cns bleed that could be again a subdural hemorrhage presentation where he will not show manifestations immediately but after few days similarly people with parkinson disease have fascinating gait again tendency to fall is present it could be simply a lady who is having disc prolapse like a lady is having sciatica and she is also obese because you see somebody is having sciatica and disc prolapse we tell person to exercise people with sciatica really can't exercise they become bedridden they put on weight and once they put on weight then the mobility part is anyway hampered he can give you any of the scenarios it may necessarily not be diabetic neuropathy that might actually result in accidental slippage it is simply the fact that whenever you read about a history of fall in the bathroom and then subsequently neurological deficit developing over a couple of days that is when you would be able to uh, evaluate and answer it the investigation choice for this condition has been told to you as a non contrast ct head where a concave convex hyperdensity or even a hypodensity can be given i repeat the fact once again it can both be hyper or in the later part of the illness a hypodensity present i have always used the word uh, uh, intensity for mri and density for a ct scan well for the management of this particular case the old lady that i described she was conscious oriented she was a total chatterbox she was chatting with me saying my son has brought me to you doctor otherwise i don't want to come and see you so in this case obviously there is no need for any kind of surgery and i'll be prescribing her acetazolamide 
and uh, over a couple of days the blood would be reabsorbed because this would be minor bleed but on the other hand let us take up the scenario of rithik roshan who almost went into coma or at least had a very low gcs when he reached a hospital his volume of bleed was pretty substantial the location of bleed was relatively infratentorial you see i am pointing towards when would you go for surgery not only for a case of posturing which would be very late what i am saying is if the gcs of the patient is low the volume of bleed is more than 30 cc i mean that's pretty serious amount in the brain and the location of bleed is infratentorial then definitely surgical intervention will be required in the patient in the sense that the clot which is pressing over the brain parenchyma has to be evacuated we need to go in for a craniotomy in the patient once again you can read about the surgical part from surgery but i wanted to highlight when would you prefer to go in for surgery is when there is a substantial deficit in this guy in my case this lady she was able to talk to me she was able to identify her son she could know that i am a doctor she could tell me whether it is morning evening or late uh, late evening i mean she was oriented in time space and person so the status of the patient will decide whether in this case surgery would be required unlike in extradural hemorrhage where almost all the cases definitive surgery would be surely required in the patient now based on the information that i provided to you i will summarize the kind of cns bleeds that we have discussed i have explained to you regarding extradural hemorrhage then subdural hemorrhage the most important from internal medicine perspective would be intraparenchymal also can be called as intracerebral bleed and subarachnoid hemorrhage is what i have discussed separately but i just want you to get a hang of the main aspects You see, extradural hemorrhage will mostly be with respect to trauma, and most of the cases will either give you an example of a cricket player who is not using a helmet, or even if he is using a helmet and Shoaib Bakhtar is bowling at more than 100 miles per hour, then you can understand the impact of a cricket ball on the head of a person that can contribute to EDH. When it comes to subdural hemorrhage, unfortunately, this would be a lady who is relatively obese and type 2 diabetic, or would be having some kind of a neurological illness like Alzheimer's, Parkinsonism, because she is having gait issues. So she, unfortunately, it could be she or a he, the person unfortunately fell in the bathroom and sustained a subdural hemorrhage. Intraparenchymal hemorrhage, majority of cases given to you will either be of hypertensive crisis or is going to be warfarin toxicity, whereas subarachnoid hemorrhage can either occur because of trauma, which happens to be the leading cause, or they would love to ask you regarding the rupture of uh, berry aneurysm, and he can obviously incorporate aspects of cranial nerve palsies there as well. And I've explained to you that in unruptured berry aneurysm, it's the third nerve that will be affected. In ruptured, again, it's the third nerve that would be affected. in extradural hemorrhage uh, you will be able to see a biconvex hyperdensity but in subdural hemorrhage it will be relatively concave or concave so obviously you can differentiate as i have highlighted initially it's going to be wide but it's no big deal that in the exam they might actually give you a concave or convex bleed but it's going to be black in color because the blood would be reabsorbed and that would be a chronic subdural hemorrhage in intraparenchymal hemorrhage there is going to be spilling of blood into the brain parenchyma and the usual site is putamen though it can have a intraventricular extension as well whereas in case of subarachnoid hemorrhage you would be able to visualize the presence of blood in the sylvian fissure either it can be sylvian fissure or it could be even interhemispheric fissure as well and i have shown cts for the same respectively in the topic of subarachnoid hemorrhage the source of bleeding extradural hemorrhage is going to be the middle meningeal artery when it comes to subdural hemorrhage it's ultimately going to be the bridging veins that would be affected in intraparenchymal hemorrhage it's one of the big branches of the middle cerebral artery that is lenticular striate artery and uh, yes guys can you remember from subarachnoid hemorrhage which blood vessel was affected well it can be any but lots of time on majority of cases subarachnoid hemorrhage would be occurring in the mca distribution these are some important issues that i wanted to remember from this tables perspective per se and over and above this i also want you to remember a pediatric domain that is intraventricular hemorrhage well why do you get intraventricular hemorrhage in adults because per se when it comes to children it is relatively easy you see whenever you read about birth trauma like for example this lady is uh, having a relatively a small pelvis and the baby is good size so uh, there was a cephalopelvic disproportion and the gynec had to use uh, outlet forceps 
Now, the gynecologist is not very skilled in applying forceps per se. So, the metallic blade, the sheer stress of the forceps can actually contribute to not only a subperiosteal hemorrhage in the baby, but it can even contribute to intraventricular hemorrhage. So, most of the time, he will describe forceps application, though technically it is a faulty forceps application on the part of the doctor. And the bad news is secondary to this birth trauma, this child after birth would be having a shrill cry. You see, how would the pediatrician know there's a brain hemorrhage? There would be a shrill cry in the baby with a bulging anterior fontanelle. You very well know that in babies, whenever there's a raised ICP, there's going to be a presentation of a bulging anterior fontanelle. We will obviously have to work up the case by doing an ultrasound skull. You can very well relate to the fact that in little babies, we are not going to go for a CT head. We are going to go for an ultrasound skull because anterior fontanelle is very much open till 18 months of age. So you can put the probe on the top of the head and you can visualize the brain tissues. And this child will be then admitted in the nursery, a neonatal intensive care unit where he will be on uh, uh, phenobarbiton because phenobarbiton is having a cerebroprotective effect. In fact, to prevent convulsions in babies, no phenobarbiton is the preferred drug that is used. When it comes to adults, in fact, that's the question to you guys. And if you answer this, that means you are listening to me carefully. And I said this, my point is that if a person is having intraparenchymal hemorrhage, then the extension of intraparenchymal hemorrhage can result in intraventricular hemorrhage as well. So there are total of five types of CNS bleeds that are basically explained to you in this lecture. And this is a summary of the main aspects that I basically want you to remember. So these are the aspects that you need to understand and uh, just get them imprinted in your brain. Thank you so much for your patience and hearing me out. Keep hammering guys, keep learning and you will definitely upgrade to much, much better, better scores and much better performance in the final exam. Thank you so much.